Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's special program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Brian Watt, morning news anchor at KQED in San Francisco, and your moderator for this program with humorist P.J. O'Rourke. We thank our audience for your support of the Commonwealth Club, and if you wish to make a donation, please text the word DONATE to 415-329-4231, 415 415- 3294231 text donate we also want to remind you to submit questions for our guest PJ O'Rourke via the chat room next to your screen i'll get to as many as possible later in the program humorist PJ O'Rourke says americans have worked ourselves into a state of anger and perplexity and it's no surprise because perplexed and angry is what america has always been about In his new book, A Cry from the Far Middle, he goes back to our country's beginnings to show us this and then snaps us back to the present where the internet and social media have brought us all together, maybe a little too close, to sort it out. He debates the merits of sympathy versus empathy and makes hilarious observations about the current political environment. Today, we're going to hear this master satirist perspective on the absurdity of life and This internet-controlled platform is absurdly perfect for this forum. Welcome, P.J. O'Rourke. Thanks for meeting us here. Thank you for having me there. (laughs) All right. So I had this really lofty question I was going to ask you first um, about the debate. But I think before I ask the lofty question, I'll ask you, did you even watch? Uh, I, I watched. (laughs) <laughs> I watched and I watched and I watched. I watched all the way through the end. Um, gosh, that was, you know, I, I've seen more substantive debates take place on a barroom floor employing fists and boots. But at least they didn't last 90 minutes. You know, I was I was kind of wishing, I, I thought Chris Wallace did as well as a human could, but I was kind of wishing for a bigger guy, maybe some NFL linebacker or somebody who could have grabbed the uh, Trump first, uh, but he could have grabbed the two candidates and by the collar and the belt loop and heaved them out into the street, honestly. (laughs) And, you know, not to, not to lay all the blame on Trump, although I think about 90% of it should go there, but also I'm very glad I wasn't playing the um, here's the deal drinking game with Joe Biden. Because if I yeah. had to take a drink every time he said, here's the deal, <laughs> I would have been in even worse shape after the debate than I was, and I was in pretty bad. I have seen a lot of hyperbole on social media about this debate, um, calling it a true tragedy in American history. Do you think that a night like this was like a truly disastrous moment in our history? No. I mean, presidential debates are rarely very substantive. Uh, I mean, you know, what do we remember from past presidential debates? George H.W. Bush looking at his wristwatch, Reagan saying, there you go again. You know, I mean, they really don't usually contain a lot of content anyway. Uh, if anybody was wondering whether Trump is really so as Trumpian as Trump appears to be, uh, that answer to that question. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I didn't feel it was a tragedy, but I, I was personally disappointed in that um, uh, Joe Biden um, has got a huge campaign platform. Uh, I've actually read the thing to, to for my sins. Uh, it took two days and it, with a certain amount of laying down in a dark room with a cold compress on my head. It is 564 pages long, minus the various links that that it will take you to. (laughs) Um, And, you know, basically, it's promise heavy. I mean, just quantitatively, the promises that are made in in that campaign. Uh, So I wanted to hear a little bit from him about how, how do you manage all this? How do you get all this through Congress? How, of course, do you pay for it? Um, you know, it's, it, it, so there was really a lot of information I wanted from Biden. I didn't really expect to get it in a presidential debate, but it would have been nice if he could get a word in it. Was. Well, since you were thinking about who might have made a better moderator, not because Chris Wallace was a bad guy for the job, but obviously it called for a whole nother skill set than the kind he brings. 
like, would you have any suggestions to Joe Biden for maybe a speech coach? Uh, no, no. Uh, it was matter uh, more a matter of uh, an interrupter coach. Um, uh, Trump was, showed himself to be better at interrupting than Biden did. Um, but but for the moderator, I would suggest somebody with a tranquilizer gun. I think that that might have been useful. Let me weave the title of your book into a question about the debate. Was there one moment where you felt like the far middle might have been crying the loudest? No, I, I really didn't. Um, uh, Joe had a tendency to fall back on boilerplate, and I don't even know if there's a polite word for what um, um, Trump fell back on. So, no, I didn't really feel that. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were discussing this after the debate, is that uh, um, you know, what we probably really wanted from Biden most is that reach out to the great majority of Americans saying, look, do you want four more years of this chaos, this unpredictability, this um, the, having a, you know, and anybody who's been a parent knows that, that feeling of finding your toddler at the top of the stairs. You forgot to close the baby gate and there's the toddler at the top of the stairs and you're standing <laughs> down at the bottom of the stairs going, oh, no, 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 no. Do we want four more years of that? Or do we want to go back to the old fashioned, normal, liberal, conservative argument? You know, liberals have got all these wonderful ideas and they're kind and they're sweet. And, they're, and, and, and doubtless, you know, a, a lot of good could be done with them. And grumpy old Republicans saying, "Well, how are you going to pay for that? You know, I mean, what kind of what kind of unintended side effects is that going to have?" And like, you know, um, if Biden were just had, had had stood there last night and say, "I promise, I promise us a return to normal. Not everything that I propose are you going to love. Not everything that you love am I going to propose. But I'm going to return us to a normal civility." predictability and uh, to the best of my extent by by partisanship, I know that's dreaming, but you know what I mean, uh, uh, is to return us to the mere anger of the Reagan years, the Clinton years, the Bush years, um, ordinary. Uh, right, exactly. Anger, yeah. Good old fashioned rancor. <laughs> yeah, good old fashioned rancor. That's what we, uh, that's what we need a dose of in this country. I'm going to take a few questions um, from the audience. They are starting to come in, um, and then we can uh, talk a little bit more about the book. Uh, how would you change the way presidential candidates are chosen, if you could? This is a question from an audience member. Yeah, well, uh, the problem is really our political parties, and the problem is with our political parties is that um, – um, they're not organized parties responsible to their members. We, you know, there is no such thing as a, as a card you carry to show that you're a Republican or a Democrat. If you donate so much of a, as a nickel to a candidate on either side, you can't help but join these parties. You can't be thrown out. Um, the national party organizations don't actually have much power. They're dependent on the state party organizations and territorial party organizations, of which there are 50 plus. And those state organizations don't actually have much power themselves um, because they're dependent on the county organization. And who the heck gets involved in county level partisan politics? I mean, name your county Democratic chairman, you know, name your county Republican chairman. I mean, who can do it? I can't do it, you know. And then because these are such sort of fringe jobs being county chairman of, of the political party. You know, the, the re typical Republican county chairman is some, you know, retired aluminum siding salesman with a, a pair of plaid polyester pants that don't match his <laughs> plaid polyester shirt and, and, a, and, a, and a Democratic uh, 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 county committee uh, 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 chairperson is a bitter divorce woman with 40 cats. And this is who's running our country. <laughs> and so even by the time the candidates get to, and then and we in the media have our own, um, uh, 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 guilt to bear in this too, because um, 
we we just can't resist the train wreck. And when we get like a nice normal candidate, um, I'll give you a Republican example, say, say Kasich, John Kasich, who's a good governor of Ohio. He brought Ohio back into the into the black when it had been in the red. Uh, he was barely elected the first term, and he was elected by a landslide in the second term. He dealt with a microcosm of America. Ohio's got all the labor management divisions, all the racial and class divisions, and all the other divisions, immigration and so on, that the, the rest of the country had. He, and when we come up with a good, albeit slightly dull, candidate like that, we're just at a loss for words. There's no handle on the guy. You know, there's nothing to pick him up and shake him by. So we we send undue attraction um, toward flashy, um, noisy, and um, and often rather extreme candidates. So we have, we 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 have we should be ashamed of ourselves. Well. Uh... Speaking of maybe a more normal uh, candidate, uh, there is an audience member who would like to know why don't you run uh, for office the way Bill Buckley did? Well, um, uh, with all all due respect to Bill, because I'm not crazy. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And the thing is that Bill wasn't really very serious about running for president um, uh, uh, because if you're actually going to run for president, can you, I mean, I'm, I'm almost 73 years old. I, I cannot imagine somebody my age, which would be either of the two candidates we've got now, plus, you know, the, 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 the two candidates we had the last time around. You, you fly around all over the nation eating like uh, 600 pancake breakfasts, you know, with, with this group and 800 spaghetti dinners with that group and giving the same rote speech to, 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 to group after group after group with all the like travel in between, no sleep. I mean, it's, it's almost as though running for president disqualifies someone for running for, for president because anybody who's willing to put themselves through that, uh, not to mention the groveling and begging for money that you have to do constantly in what few moments of spare time you have. I mean, first place, those people can't be devoting much thought to the issues because there's no time. And the second place, they obviously have something deeply wrong with them. You know, you know, if you look up narcissistic personality disorder in the physician's desk manual or the psychiatrist's desk manual, um, and you look through the, the indications, you know, for indications for narcissistic personality disorder, and there are like nine of them. And the average politician like uh, ticks the box on 11 out of nine. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, maybe we should result to the uh, result resort. Maybe we should resort to the draft, you know, maybe anybody who wants to be president. I thought Colin Powell would have been a great president and I know he didn't want to, but I think we should have drafted him, you know, I mean, he was in the military. He understands the draft. Right. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about this book. Um, Everyone who is watching, everyone who's joining us, please don't hesitate to continue adding questions um, in the chat space. Um, But I thought it was interesting that you wound up having to write a pre-preface to this book. And what it shows to me is just how much things are changing and how quickly things are changing um, just as we go. And I thought you could read some of that to us um, and just just so that everyone gets a sense of sort of, I, I feel like this is a, a nice uh, way to sort of see what all we've been through in a very, very short time. So, um, and it gives you a yeah, little flavor I'm, of what we're getting into. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, um, the, you know, I, I wrote the book, you know, b- books take a long time to go into production. I wrote the book um, last year. Uh, and some of the pieces in the book have been written before that. And I was all done thinking that we were living in hell when all hell broke, broke loose. You know, and fortunately, modern printing technology allowed me to slip in at the last minute with a, uh, as we go to press, where I said, um, while this book was being written in 2019, America was deep in an era of idiot populism and hooligan partisanship. Our country was engaged in a sort of socio-political Peloponnesian war. 
That is, we were in the midst of a long, confusing, tedious, useless, foolish conflict that threatened to destroy democracy and left ordinary, commonsensical people feeling, it's all Greek to me. Then, when this book was being edited and typeset, somebody ate an undercooked bat in a Wuhan wet market. Panic and pandemic ensued. The nation was brought to a stay-at-home standstill. Whether reasonably or not, no one is quite certain, and by whose authority, no one is quite sure. It's like being 16 again, a friend of mine said. Gas is cheap and I'm grounded. Then, with everyone cooped up, going crazy and going broke, some fuss budget with a loose mutt in Central Park calls 9-11, there's an African-American man threatening my life after she'd been admonished by a Harvard-educated bird watcher, who, if video is anything to go by, is the very picture of a Harvard-educated bird watcher. On the same day that that Central Park display of American inclusiveness and mutual respect, members of the Minneapolis police force decided to take a knee on the neck of George Floyd. After nearly nine minutes of suffocation, Floyd died. He was accused of spending $20 in the form of a banknote that had no actual value. The U.S. Senate and House of Representatives are currently spending billions of dollars in the form of banknotes that have no actual value. Would the police employ the same bigotry and violence on them? <laughs> no. All across the country, the police would employ bigotry and violence on people protesting the bigotry and violence of the police. Chaos cried out its appeal. The thievish and the vandalistic are friends of chaos, and when their friend calls, they come. The President of the United States called for peace, understanding, and unity. In a pig's ass, he did. The President waddled down to his bunker hidey hole under the White House and urged the U.S. military to invade the country they live in. Then he talked trash and went to church. He could use it attacking thousands of nonviolent demonstrators to get there. Not a very Christian way of going to church. And that's where things stood as this book made its socially distancing and peacefully protesting way to the printer. All this is to say that my book looks back on an era of troubles that in retrospect seem to have been the good old days. And now I, who have covered politics and all its works and all its empty promises for half a century, and who had so very many things to say about them, am left mute. There are people possessed of the expertise necessary to explain, analyze, and make judicious commentary upon the present and future effects of the novel coronavirus. And there are, I suppose, people endowed with the foresight to determine the outcome of the social upheavals accompanying the pandemic. I'm not one of either of them. And the last thing the world needs at the moment is more pundits who don't know what they're talking about. Journalists are supposed to provide answers, but all I've got is questions, starting with, isn't somebody supposed to be in charge? Too many of America's elected leaders have uh, been acting as if the pandemic is a, is a children's party game where they're all blindfolded and swinging sticks, except they're clobbering each other instead of the virus pinata. Under microscopic view, a coronavirus does look like it would make a swell paper mache target full of lethal pathogens. So let's leave the politicians to amuse themselves while we skip this fiesta, <clears throat> which raises another question about this book itself. Is it now completely beside the point? Will American politics be fundamentally changed by the pandemic? Will Americans emerge from their grievous health crisis, lockdown, isolation, economic collapse, and material deprivation with a newly calm, pragmatic, and reasonable attitude toward our political system? Will our reawakened awareness of systemic prejudice cause us to critically analyze and democratically restrain our civil institutions Will we abandon the factional hysterias and histrionics of the early 21st century in favor of a polity based upon competence, civil discourse, and goodwill? Or will we revert to our petty arguments and stupid admin, or I can never say this word, I can write it, but I can't <laughs> say it, animadurvations, ah, arguments, so let's stick with petty, petty and stupid arguments. 
uh, or or having spent had had all this time alone to dwell on our grievances and affronts, will we maybe even return to our spiteful quarreling with renewed vigor? This is often the way human nature works, and um, and I'm betting human nature will triumph over adversity and challenge, and I don't mean that in a good way. Thank you very much. I I thought that that was a neat way to sort of remind everybody that the world has changed really quickly and a lot in really 2019 and 2020. Yeah, and I'm blink curious, of the eye, really. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to believe when you all the things you ticked off: George Floyd, the bird watcher in Central Park, um, the pandemic. I'm curious what, how you're living this. Let, let's talk, for example, about masks. Are you wearing a mask when you go out of the house? What's, what's you like bet that? I am. I'm, I'm 70, almost as I said, I'm almost 73 years old. I smoke, I drink. I've had some prior health problems, as you know, somebody my age who smokes and drinks probably would. Uh, of course, I wear a mask. And uh, I got to say, people in New England are pretty good about wearing masks. Not great, not perfect. Um, it seems like the, there's a certain sort of more macho type that, 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 uh, that eschews the mask, but uh, mostly people are pretty good about it here. But it does, it's, you know, it adds that, uh, boy, if I have to go on a plane flight or something or wear one, you know, for eight hours in a row, I'm going to have to shave this beard. It gets really uncomfortable under there. And you, you know, you get, it, it just adds this little extra layer of annoyance, you know, to, to everything. Um, we live way out in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. And so in many ways, this didn't affect us um, all that much. One thing about old line Yankees, they're good at social distancing. They've been social distancing since they got off the Mayflower. You know, the only time they get closer than six feet to each other is when they're hanging witches in Salem, you know, so, um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's probably the right place to live, uh, during these times. What are you asking for in this book? If it's a, if it's a cry from the far middle, what, what's, what's the cry for? Well, it is, you know, what we were talking about a little earlier, it's getting, it's getting back to old fashioned rancor. Let's, let, 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 let's, let's, there's a lot of really, you in know, a, in, a, in a country as large as ours, with a government as large as ours, and our desire to have that government do so many things for us, which uh, our desire for, for uh, more things from the government often results in more government than we want. So that you have, you, you constantly facing this conundrum. Plus, there's, you know, there are limited resources. Um, um, so I'm asking us to get back to, to arguing the substance of this. You know, I, I mean, it doesn't mean that we all have to be fence sitters, but we could make that fence top wider and more comfortably padded and go sit on it for a while and have a little neighborly chat about these things, because there are a lot of things to be decided. And there's going to have to be argument. I mean, real argument. I don't mean the kind of argument that we saw last night. There's going to have to be argument about how to um, uh, 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 how to go about doing these things. And it's a legitimate argument that we need to have. And instead, we're just busy screaming at each other. Hmm. As a journalist or content creator, you write something real funny about your transition between those. Um, do you see your place as in the middle or far off to the side? Your place in all of this? Well, you know, I'm a I'm a humor I, I'm a humorist. I'm a commentator. Um, you know, I'm a, some kind of pundit or something. So that you know, my job has always been to be opinionated and to make fun of people and so so on and so forth. But I'm also a reporter, and as a reporter. Um, I spent a long time, you know, I mean, between between stints of just making fun of stuff, I spent a long time as a reporter. I spent uh, 20 years as, as, as a foreign correspondent, first for Rolling Stone magazine and then um, um, for the Atlantic Monthly. Um, took me from um, the old Soviet Union, the Civil War in Lebanon, to the Gulf War, the war in Iraq. And um, when I'm being a reporter... It is my job 
just to report the facts. It is, it is well, not just to report the facts, because you try, have to try and explain what the facts mean. But you can't get it factually wrong um, and have any sort of self-respect. And there has been a blurring of the lines, I think, between like the two sides of my job. I, I try not to, 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 to blur them. I try to make it, I'm, I try to make sure that people know, as we said back in the 60s, where I'm coming from um, so that they can allow windage for my, my, my point of view. But, you know, I, 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 it's, it's important to, to stick to the facts. Do you feel like that profession of the reporter, the journalist, has been under attack more viscerally and viciously in the last four years than it? Oh, no won. doubt about it. No doubt about it. I mean, but, 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 but Trump has given extra voice to and, and, and huge exaggeration to a, a, a tendency that's been going on for a long time, and I dated back to Watergate days, is that this for a long time, um, I think ordinary people in the United States have felt a little disconnected from the world of journalism, perceiving it as being sort of um, um, not all liberal. I mean, obviously, there are conservative voices out there, but all being sort of coasty elite um, uh, and, 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 you know, sort of looking down their nose at, 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 the, at the consumers of news a bit. And I blame it on, on, on a, a shift in the industry that, 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 that happened, um, as I say, back as early as Watergate. You know, in the old days, reporters were um, uh, uh, blue collar, blue collar Guys, they mostly were guys. You know, I mean, there were women reporters, excellent women reporters, but but it was you know mainly it was a blue collar guy profession. And if you grew up in a trashy Irish neighborhood like I did, and uh, uh, you wanted uh, you didn't want to get up real early in the morning and lift heavy things for a living, and you liked to read, uh, uh, you liked books, you basically had two choices: you could be a newspaper reporter or you could be a priest. You know, so it was this choice between, well, what's it going to be, whiskey and women or just whiskey, you know, and, you know, which one's more likely to get me free hockey tickets? <laughs> so, so it was a craft. And uh, this is not to say old fashioned journalism couldn't be very partisan, but it was fundamentally a craft. It was and, and, and reporters looked upon themselves like other craftsmen do, like plumbers and electricians and bricklayers and so on. Then along came Watergate, and all of a sudden, journalists became world savers, you know, and, and it's like all the people who were lined up to join the Peace Corps went to journalism school instead. You know, journalism school, I never even heard of journalism school when, when I didn't even know such a thing existed. Um, and um, uh, so that a lot of do-gooders flooded into, um, into the field of journalism, and do-gooders, whether they're right-wing do-gooders or left-wing do-gooders or even middle... Do-gooders can make a good mess out of a lot of things if they're allowed to go too far with their do-gooding. I see. Liv, I'm going to get a few more questions in uh, from the audience. Um, definitely appreciate that they're coming in. One audience member wants to know, uh, what are your thoughts on both parties essentially being controlled by the same forces, corporatists, who will come out fine no matter who wins? That's the question. And, and it's a question that raises a good point. Um, the, uh, uh, the influence of giant corporations in the United States is like awesome to be behold. And, and, and I'm not sure I mean awesome in, in, in a very pretty way. Um, we have to let loose of the idea that we're going to get money out of politics. Uh, even if we publicly fund elections, that's still money. And that still comes from someplace. And people are going to influence where that money goes and how that money goes. Um, the, um, yeah, uh, what to do about about giant corporations and, and their influence is is a very difficult question. Do you take the, you can take a sort of anti-corporate stand, but on the other hand, we owe these corporations quite a bit of our, our material responsibility. And we don't want to punish people for success or tear down something that works. Uh, and and it, it really is a, a, a huge conundrum. 
And the probably uh, the, the, the answer lies in more responsible corporate boards and more input on those corporate boards from citizen stockholders. And also, I would say that the, um, the people who operate in a purely financial realm, who are moving huge blocks of stock around all the time, um, probably need to be kept a little better eye on. I, I say this as, a, as an old line capitalist, but honestly, uh, when, 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 when you look at the gigantic movements of the money managers, um, uh, the, 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 the way that they sort of dominate the market as opposed to individual investors or relatively small entities, um, that, 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 that needs looking at. There's no doubt about that. It's a, it, it puts us back in a kind of uh, a parallel situation to Teddy Roosevelt trust busting. Mm. Uh, another audience member wants to know, might the U.S. be better off with a parliamentary system? Well, judging by what's going on in Britain with um, 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 Brexit and uh, 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 Boris Johnson and, uh, uh, and, and Scottish independence questions and the re still remaining mess in Northern Ireland and uh, noise from Wales, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, so, um, you know, what, 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 what we're better off with, uh, I, you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about how our, our parties don't exercise sufficient control over who, who runs for those parties. But one of the things that makes America great is, that, is also that we don't have political parties in the European sense of the word. Um, that, that what we have is two broad tendencies uh, two broad general tendencies, and one broad general tendency is to think the government should take care of, 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 of problems, and the other broad tendency is the government is the problem. And um, these are two ideas that can be held at the same time in the same mind without causing insanity or cognitive dissonance. Uh, anybody who has sat down to fill out all the forms necessary to get some government benefit that they deserve and need um, uh, has known that thought to, to, to think at the same time, government should solve the problem and government is the problem. So we have these two broad tendencies. Sometimes they have more overlap. Sometimes they have a lot of overlap. Sometimes at the moment, for instance, the, the, the two Venn, Venn diagrams are, are barely touching each other. But it, it, it allows us to um, uh, uh, repair our partisan anger more quickly than is, than is possible in countries with a multitude of parties um, or countries with a, um, a, a, a sort of out of control Congress, which is Parliament is, that uh, um, uh, can produce all sorts of results that nobody in Britain for us all. Both of our parties have either had to do battle with or even make peace with the amazing level of national debt. Uh, one audience member wants to know, how do we get out of this debt that we are in as a country uh, from your perspective? Oh, we just uh, throw it off on our grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are two ways out. There's the hard way out, which is to limit government spending um, and uh, not necessarily reduce it, but keep it within bounds while doing our best to encourage economic growth. This is basically how we got out of it. We, we were in a, a, a similar debt and deficit situation at, at the end of World War II. We owed a ton of money um, and, uh, uh, and we were running, you know, huge deficits, obviously, to fund the war. It's for a good purpose, but nonetheless, it had effects. Uh, we put ourselves through a temporary recession right after the war. It was short, mercifully, and uh, we clamped down. The Truman administration did somewhat. The Eisenhower administration actually ran surpluses. Uh, we kept our spending in control, and we kept our and our, and, and remember that 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 the tax rates back then were very high. So we kept our government income up, we kept our government expenditures down, and we grew economically. 
Uh, now, of course, there was a lot of pent up demand and there was a lot of uh, savings from war bonds and so on to, to, to help us with that. But it can be done. Um, the, the easy way is to just keep piling on the debt. But this is going to end badly somehow. I don't, I'm not an economist. I don't know how, you know, and I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know when. But, you know, we could have runaway inflation. We could have a loss of the U.S. dollar as the international reserve currency, which allows us to almost unlimited borrowing powers. Uh, we could have a, a, a massive devaluation of the U.S. dollars, which would make all foreign products, and we use a lot of them, all foreign products, wildly expensive. So, you know, that, that's the easy way out. <laughs> so, so I'm voting for the hard way out, you know, but I'm not, nobody in either party seems to be willing to mention the hard way out. I thought that used to be one of the fundamental um, uh, divisions between liberals and conservatives was that, you know, liberals were spend, 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 and conservatives were going, well, where's all money coming from? Now it's like spend, spend, spend from both sides, right. admittedly on different things. And, uh, and nobody seems to be paying any attention to where the money's coming from. Man. There is a question uh, from the audience uh, about the internet. Um, mm. I'm going to, I'm going to ask it, but um it, it actually takes me to another passage in the book that I think I told you that I really appreciated and thought uh, the audience would appreciate hearing a, a bit of. So um, the question is, how has the Internet impacted serious thought in America? And I feel like you get to that right here uh, in in a chapter that uh, I want you to name and, and, and give us a little taste of here. Yes, I have a chapter uh, in the book that pretty much uh, addresses that question. And the chapter is called, Whose Bright Idea Was It to Make Sure That Every Idiot in the World Was in Touch with Every Other Idiot? And I, in that chapter, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning of it. Social media comes in for a lot of uh, other criticism as well. Uh, the big corporations that operate social media platforms have the ethics of opioid addicts with jobs as OxyContin pharmaceutical sales reps. User privacy is equivalent to getting a prostate exam in the middle of Times Square on New Year's Eve while you and your urologist ride the ball drop. Social media turns us into easy victims of fraud and financial manipulation. Darn it, of all the Nigerian government officials, I spam blocked the one who actually had $100 million that needed to be wired to my bank account. Social media is giving young people a bad case of phone face with big permanent Samsung Galaxy Note 9 pimple between their eyes, and it makes our kids into victims of bullies or perpetrators of bullying, depending on whether our kids are dorks or jerks, and in my experience, every kid is both. Um, social media polarizes our politics by allowing us all, no matter how wrong we are, about a political issue to find a large, enthusiastic group of people who are even wronger. I, I love that last line so much. That's um, I, I, I do wonder if more people are looking for validation in social media than they are looking for accurate and helpful information. Validation, yes. Worse than validation, uh, a, a sort of like uh, uh, egotistic presence, uh, uh, a, a, a shout from the rooftops, uh, a, um, a, a look at me sort of thing. And of course, the way you get people to look at me is by doing something unusual and doing something unusual is usually means doing something stupid. Um, it's very interesting, you know, that, that there was this idea prevalent back in the 50s and the 60s um, that we, we, we should all communicate. We all need to communicate. If only parents could communicate to their children, they, the, the generation gap would be closed. If, if, if only uh, 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 black people and white people could communicate, the, 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 the racial gap, uh, 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 the inequality gap w w w would be closed. If only the USA and the USSR could communicate with each other, then then the Cold War would, would, would be over. And a lot of us like 
thought that was a great idea. Paul really bought into that. And our, and, and our hero was Marshall McLuhan, uh, the great media theorist, who, um, um, who said that television, this was before computers, of course, that television was going to create a global village. And we're going, oh, global village, that's so cool. Well, the thing is, we were, we were lauding McLuhan without reading McLuhan. And if we'd actually paid attention to what McLuhan was saying, it, we would have realized um, um, that he was far more skeptical of the outcome of this global village um, than, than we might have thought. And I found a radio interview with McLuhan, a Canadian radio interview with McLuhan, um, where the interviewer says, uh, well, uh, Dr. McLuhan, you said uh, that television was going to create a global village. And McLuhan said, I never said the villagers would like each other. And it was McLuhan's feeling that if people got closer and closer to each other, if people really knew what other people were thinking, if they could hear, as we can today, what other people are thinking, it would be like, well, you know, it would be like always knowing what one's spouse was thinking about one, you know, unfiltered, or listening to Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, 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 putting us all on the same brainwave uh, has not really done us all a favor. One of the things that, that I don't know how successful we've been, but we've tried to teach our kids is kids, everything that pops into your mind does not have to pour out your mouth. Right. Right. Well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about back to the debate last night, the, the moment that really got social media um, and the internet crazy was these opportunities that president Trump had to denounce white supremacist movements, and very specifically, the Proud Boys. And this stand back and stand by thing, as soon as he said it, just went out there. And the Proud Boys were proud. They were even more proud, and it was able to echo through social media. That was just horrible. I mean, that was unconscionable. I mean, you know, I, 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 I've been covering politics for 50 years. I expect them to lie. I expect them to exaggerate. I expect them to interrupt each other. But when you have an opportunity to denounce evil, you know, what's your, what's your opinion of Hitler? Well, you know, he had some good ideas. He had some bad ideas. You know, <laughs> get out of here, you know. That was like a, I mean, that was such a softball. And, you know, I, 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 you know, Chris, Chris Wallace is not a hostile review, not a hostile interviewer, although he's, he was getting there by the end of the night, but he's not, I mean, it's, this is Fox news, you know, and that was such a softball from him. And all Trump had to say was, I mean, he, he could have even been as flabby as saying, I dev I denounce violence by anyone, anywhere, at any time. That is not the way we solve our problems in this country. And of course, he could have been like much more forthright and say, you know, that, 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 that uh, you know, race, racist groups, you know, white supremacist groups are, are, are repellent and, and, and disgusting. Uh, it, it was so simple, and yet he couldn't, bring himself to do it. What is the matter with him? I mean, a lot of people are thinking was to set some sort of like Dr. Evil plot of his to get all 11 proud boys or however many of there are, you know, out, out, out to vote. Um, I think, you know, I, there's a side of Trump that we don't give enough credit to, or not credit is not the word I'm looking for, but there's a side of Trump that we don't pay as much attention to. The guy's not very smart. He's crafty. He has peasant cunning. There is no doubt about that. Um, he is, uh, uh, he's, he's sneaky. He's, 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 you know, it's not that his mind doesn't work at all. But we're just not talking about a very smart guy. And that does not excuse the, 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 the failure to, to, to field that softball. But, uh, uh, but it, it does, like, it's a light that we don't, cast enough on, on on trump is that, that that in so many ways he's i mean he's 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 not all that smart and he's massively ignorant hmm. Hmm. 
An audience member wants to know who is better at propaganda, the far left or the far right? Well, neither one of them are doing a very good job as far as I, I, I'm concerned. Is that, that, that you know, I, I sometimes think that, that, that uh, Antifa and, uh, and, and the rest uh, must be on Trump's payroll because they're at the moment they're running the only effective campaign for Trump that I've seen out there. Uh, on meanwhile, I wonder if Joe Biden isn't paying for Donald Trump's Twitter account because Donald Trump's Twitter account is the, pretty much the best campaign for Joe Biden that I've seen. So, now I don't think either one of them are very good at propaganda, especially if we, we look back to the people who really w were good. Uh, and this is using propaganda in, 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 in a neutral or, or, or even a, a benign sense. If we look back at the civil rights movement as it grew through the 50s and, 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 and came to full fruition in the 1960s, the, the people who, who, who believed in the civil rights movement, and they were good people, were they did a good job at changing other people's minds. They did a really good job. They were patient. They were rational. They were nonviolent. They worked very hard. And... You know, and they thought deep, and ultimately it mattered. It didn't happen overnight. You know, it probably took 20, many more years than that, really, but in its most active phase, it probably took 20 years. Um, but they were effective propagandists. After all, not all propaganda is untrue. I'm just curious what the, what you think is the modern day version of that civil rights, the, the civil rights movement of today that, you know, isn't just going to help people understand a better way to live, but is also going to get us to a place where we can share facts and analysis that are similar so that we can work together. Well, I don't see that movement out there. Although I do feel that there's a strong libertarian streak that's probably uh, uh, a think tank like the Cato Institute in Washington, with who, in full disclosure, with whom I've been associated for years and years, I think they do a pretty good job of doing that. But you know, it's it, it's it, we we don't see, for instance, we 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 don't see anything resembling the civil rights movement. And I take that as one of the great liberal moments, the really commendable liberal moments in, in, in American history. Uh, nor do we see anything like the, um, uh, um, the groundswell um, that was for the Reagan administration that was warning us about a, uh, having a large, an over large but over weak uh, a federal government, a federal government that couldn't get out of its own way. Uh, but at the same time, didn't really seem to be able to project any sort of strength around the world. Um, you know, those, those people worked very hard to get their point across uh, uh, during the run up to the Reagan administration and during, especially during the first term of the Reagan administration. I don't see that equivalent out there either. Um, the libertarians probably come uh, as, as close as, as we can get, albeit um, libertarianism can sometimes be a little hard to deal with when, when they get into issues like foreign policy. You know, it's, I've, I've been pointing out to years from my non-interventionalist foreign policy friends that uh, foreign policy is, off, after all, it's foreigners who are in charge of it. And so <laughs> it's sometimes, sometimes a little hard for us to get uh, uh, do just what we want in terms of foreign policy. Uh, I have a Another debt question from, it's actually two questions from an audience member. Um, do the Chinese still hold most of our debt? And who do you think holds the president's personal debt that we've learned a lot more about in the last few days? Um, I think that actually the president's personal debt is mostly held by some extremely unhappy bankers, but uh, I, 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 I'm not I'm not one for great conspiracy theories. I don't. I think it would be fun to find out that the Russians held Trump's uh, um, uh, personal debt, but uh, uh, I don't actually think that they do. You know, conspiracy theories are always based upon the idea that uh, the world is so stupid that even I can understand it.
you know, so in fact, don't generally go with that. Uh, I really don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no uh, economic expert. I really don't know how much of our debt is held by the uh, uh, is held by the Chinese government. Nor do I know how how easily they could liquidate that debt. You know, I mean, all all forms of 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 you know stocks, bonds, all forms of promissory notes, and so on uh, have a market. And um, it, 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 they, may, they have a market price, but if you try and sell a million of them at a time or a billion or a trillion of them at a time, um, that's going to flood the market and the price is going to go way down. So the Chinese, I'm sure they hold quite a lot of our debt. I know they hold quite a lot of our debt, but it may not be that easy for them to get rid of it. But, you know, if they, I do know enough about macroeconomics to know that if the Chinese were to let the renminbi, let their currency float, so that their f- currency was freely traded against other currencies, uh, given, you know, if, if they're able to continue their phenomenal economic growth, um, that could present an alternative. At the moment, um, people are a little unwilling to buy into Chinese bonds because it is a dictatorship. The rule, rule of law is suspect over there. Um, so it isn't as an, an attractive, uh, but, you know, Rule of law is getting a little suspect here. Um, I don't think we're headed for a dictatorship. Uh, fortunately, we have enough checks and balances for that. Uh, you know, whatever Trump says to the contrary. Um, but um, rule of law is not happy. I, when you mentioned the Russians, it, it, I, you know, grew up. I was just in that sort of Cold War. This sense that you know, one unresolvable conflict between us and the Russians could result in nuclear war. But, you know, that was a that was a real fear of mine when I grew up. And I frankly have just been surprised about I, I don't hear enough people talking about Russian meddling in our elections. Um I I feel like the Republican Party which used to be kind of obsessed with the Russian threat, does not seem to be very interested in talking about it now. No, they don't. You know, and and of course, it's not the um, um, uh, it, it's not probably the meddling per se. I, it's just the thing about Russian election meddling was that uh, something as complex and and uh, uh, difficult and um, uh, elaborate as the American electoral system, the idea that the Russians could get in and fix that, well, I've driven Russian cars, I'm doubting it, you know. Um, so, you know, I understand um, that, that that some Republicans may feel that, that Russian interference was, was overplayed, but they don't seem to be as scared of Russia as they ought to be. Russia has still got all those nukes. And if anything, the current government under Putin seems less responsible, uh, uh, more impulsive, uh, uh, more aggressive indeed, uh, and, and, and much less predictable than the old commies were. Bring back Brezhnev, you know, as far as that goes. And then uh, the Chinese, of course, also have the capability to blow up the world. And I don't think that Xi Jinping is likely to do that, as I think, you know, it would be a black mark on his record if he blew up the world um, and probably wouldn't help economic growth in China. But the Chinese system of selecting their leadership is utterly opaque. We have no idea what's going on back there. And we have no guarantee that they won't get their own Putin uh, in all due time. So we should be we should probably be as scared about atomic weapons. Plus, there are more of them. India's got them. Pakistan's got them. Maybe Iran has them, you know, Israel has them. We should probably be more scared about nukes than we were when we were crawling under our desks as kids. An audience member would like to know, uh, as as we get closer uh, to the to the end of this uh, discussion. um, Will Trump win? And if not, will he concede? Uh, I, I don't see how he can win. But on the other hand, I have been wrong about Donald Trump in general and in detail in every respect 
since the guy first started making noises about the presidency back in the 1980s. I have just absolutely been dismissive of him. Um, I don't think that he can win. He's got his solid base and he's not going to lose that solid base. But I think there are a lot of people um, who sent Trump to Washington basically as a disruptor, who were frustrated with the federal government and said, look, we've tried, we've tried Republicans, we've tried Democrats, we've tried this, we've tried that. Uh, let's, let's, let's just send a circus clown down there and let him, you know, kick over all the buildings and, and sort of start over again. Um, I don't think they have been pleased with the results or not enough of them have been pleased with the results. So I, I would predict, actually, I think that um, Biden will win. I think that the uh, Democrats will take the Senate. And, you know, for a conservative libertarian like myself, that's going to mean a couple of very expensive years with a lot of governmental errors. But I'm willing to pay the price to bring American politics back into the uh, uh, in, into the realm of reality. Will he concede? Yes, he will concede. There's like too much, um, uh, th th there's too much pressure and precedence and weight of government. America is a big ship of state and we've got a lot of keel on this ship and we can take water from the right, we can take water from the left. And we have a tendency to right ourselves. We've been through, people say, oh, America is so divided. I go, well, you know, I, I, I'm from the 60s. Uh, and and not, not only do I remember when America was much in a much worse state of division than it is now, I, I, I actually helped make that division, you know, in my own small personal way. Um, and forget the, the 1960s. What about the 1860s? What about 1861? I mean, say what you will about the situation at the moment. Fort Sumter is not taking any incoming. So uh, I think we'll right ourselves. Um, uh, I certainly hope the, uh, that, that uh, um, um, Joe Biden, uh, who, like I say, is not my favorite politician in the world, but I, ho I hope that he wins. But I don't think there's much question that, 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 that Trump uh, uh, will, will concede there might be a little ugly, a little court fight in here. This does take us back, though, doesn't it? It's hilarious. It takes us back to Bush v. Gore. And if you remember, really, the truth of the matter, if we think back about this, is that after all the sort of ups and downs and the surus and the, uh, and, and the, the mind rattling of the Clinton administration, we didn't really care whether it was Bush or Gore. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it went on forever, but it wasn't like there was any rioting in the street or anything. People were going, Bush, Gore, whatever, you know. <laughs> it's a little different now. It's a little different now. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> oh, wow. Just a few minutes left. I, I, I think an audience member wants to no, just get back into the heads of people as they process all that's flying at them. But the question really is simple. Do people generally believe what they want, no matter the facts? Um, yes, on impulse, they do. After three drinks, they do. You know? But <laughs> I, I think most of us are able to coldly consider in the, in, in the light of day. You know, I mean... The, the, the first and most necessary uh, uh, requirement of democracy is the capacity to change your mind. One of the things that, that I really loved about Bill Buckley was that Bill Buckley always said, you know, if you come to me with a better argument, I will change my mind. I don't know if he ever did change his mind, but he, you know. <laughs> he at least but, said you know, he would. He, you know, at least he said he would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. No, I, I think people's minds can be changed. We've watched people's minds can be changed very recently. I mean, not, I was talking about the civil rights movement, but much more recently on, on the question of gay marriage. Uh, I think that was if we go back 20 years, you'd say that's a no starter. That's never, ever going to happen. People change their minds about it. And uh, I was one of them. I was always in favor of, of, of civil unions. I was always in favor of e equality. You know, um, uh, that, 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 you know, a, a, a committed gay couple should have the same legal rights as, as a, a, you know, I, I thought, I just was thinking of marriage as being separate from the law, that, 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 that a civil marriage is a contractual obligation and that, a, and that, you know, marriage is a religious ceremony, so on and so forth. 
And so I thought, really, there, there should be a distinction here. And I talked to my gay friends. And gay friends of mine said, um, explain to me how important it, gay marriage was to them as being something that made them part of the larger society. And I thought making people part of the larger society, that's a really important thing. Plus, it means a lot to these people. It means much more to these people than I had realized that it meant. I changed my mind. You know, I didn't have to go very far to change my mind on that. It wasn't like I was coming from, you know, some sort of uh, born again point of view. But, but, but nonetheless, people do change their minds. And our nation changed its mind about that just a few years ago. And yeah, we're capable of changing our minds. This last question I'll ask you is really something that I kept thinking about as I read your book, particularly particularly in the part about being able to find the echo chamber out in the internet. But do you think it would help if we all didn't feel so compelled to have a strong opinion about everything? Yes, I honestly do. I honestly do. I, I've been a reporter for a long time. And one thing being a reporter teaches you is how much you don't know and how many experts there are and out there. And yes, the, the sort of internet driven um, idea that we all have to have strong opinions about everything and that we all must be heard. Um, some of us could be mo most eloquent by, by shutting up. You know, I mean, I, as I say in the book, I think that I think that the that we, you know, we, that America would be better off with with fewer people who knew what it would take to make America better off, that we'd be better off with fewer people opinions, especially political opinions, and including my own. Um, yeah, it's very important to, I mean, when you when you face something like this health crisis, and if you think about the complications and, the, and how long it took to figure out what it is we should be doing and what we should, shouldn't be doing, and, and how hard it's been to convince people of what we do know and how we, what we know changes from day to day, um, it's important to keep an open mind and to listen to people that know more than we do about a subject. You know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to listen to you about radio, you know, I, 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 you know, and if, if, if you were writing a book, I, I would hope you would listen to me about prose, you know, and um, 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 like, it's just the same, you know, I listen to my mechanic when I take my car, I don't go in and say, no, I don't, I, I don't feel I don't feel like the muffler's bad. I feel like the car is making loud noises because, uh, <laughs> you know, I offended it. Yeah. Humorist PJ O'Rourke, thank you very much uh, for, as I said, meeting us here in this forum with the Commonwealth Club. Well, you're very welcome. It's always a great pleasure to talk to the Commonwealth Club. No better audiences uh, and no better questions are available anywhere. P.J. O'Rourke is the author of the new book, A Cry from the Far Middle, which I have really enjoyed reading. It is, of course, available at your local bookstore. We also thank the viewing our audience. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit CommonwealthClub.org. I'm Brian Watt. Thank you, and everyone, please stay safe. You get it? Yeah, we're...